So hello everyone. I hope that you can see me. I'm in lovely cold Melbourne here. It's already evening. Um, I will introduce myself in my talk, but just for everyone who doesn't know me or hasn't found me online yet, I am a beamline scientist at the Sachs Lux Beamline at the Synchrotron in Melbourne um, as part of ANSTO. And I will talk to you about um, microfluidics for in situ investigation, which is a topic that I mainly did during my PhD. So for everyone here from ANSTO who has seen my speaker series talk, um, there will be a lot of familiar slides probably. Um, for everyone else, I'm going to hopefully share my slides with you now. Let's see if this works. I hope you can see this. So um, what are we talking about today? We will talk about microfluidics. I will talk about microfluidics for in situ investigation, taking a closer look at reaction kinetics um, to myself, as I promised you, um, if this works. Oh, yeah, it works. Um, I studied at the University of Bayreuth. So I'm originally from Germany, living in Melbourne now. Um, I studied at the University of Bayreuth, did my Bachelor in Science in Chemistry and that Master of Science in um, a bit of a more specific topic called polymer science. Um, for everyone who's not very familiar with the small town Germany, and Bayreuth is there where the little red knob is on the map. And it's mainly famous for um, people who are interested in classical music for Richard Wagner and Franz Liszt. And for people who are more interested in poetry, it is also very famous for um, Jean Paul, who was there as a writer. Um, as I said, I'm going to talk to you about my PhD um, or topics that I did during my PhD. And I always say that my PhD was a bit like a roller coaster because I did it jointly between the University of Bayreuth and the University of Melbourne. So I started um, in Professor Stefan Förster's group, um, who I also did my master's with. And I um, then jointly did it also as part of the University of Melbourne and part of Paul Mulvaney's group. So, but kind of combined um, two experts' opinions on my thesis. So, Stefan is the scattering expert and Paul is the nanoparticle expert. Um, and there were a lot of, you know, hurdles to overcome, mainly that <laughs> my German supervisor was uh, meanwhile moving to Jülich and is now the head of the Neutron Scattering Institute there. And uh, Paul was moving labs, so he was um, moving from a bio-centered building in Melbourne back to the good old chemistry at Uni Melbourne. Um, so my way after my PhD kind of went from, I always say from West Germany to the Eastern suburbs of Melbourne. So I, after my PhD, I decided to move permanently to Melbourne and did a bit of an employment at the University of Melbourne after my PhD before moving on to a postdoc at RMIT University. And now I'm um, since March this year, a beamline scientist at the Sachs Wax team here at the Synchrotron. Um, my current team looks like this, and if you've seen the lovely talk from my colleague Helen, you've already seen these pictures. Um, we're big Lego fans, so <laughs> this is our current team image. So you can see the um, single team members up top, and this is like all the contributors to um, the lovely and really, really interesting science we do on our beamline um, with our new, fairly new um, vacuum vessel where the detector sits in. So this talk, just a bit of an outline, um, I'll give you a quick motivation about why I did this. And then I will give you a lot of examples, hopefully, um, with a very broad background of you know, different shapes and sizes of particles. So um, how, how I used microfluidics in combination with X-ray scattering and a lot of other things. Um, and namely speaking about gold nanorods, trisomites, and quantum dots. So what is the, measure, like the motivation behind all of this, what I did during my PhD and what I will talk about today? Um, it's mainly, if you think about you know, chemistry, and if a lot of people who are not very familiar about it think about chemists, they think that you know, we put things in a beaker um, to let some magic happen, whatever that magic might be, nucleation growth or self-assembly of particles. And then in the end, you get or do not get your product that you <laughs> wanted to have. And there are a couple of ways to you know, look at it during and after the synthesis, um, spectroscopy methods, for example, absorption emission, electron microscopy, SDM, TM, or even X-ray scattering with sucks and bugs. But a lot of these methods, or mainly all of them, for you know looking what's happening during this reaction, is have transfer time. So you can't really do in situ kinetic measurements, or it's really hard. Um, so what we kind of wanted to do is 
move from a batch experiment where we can only look at the time axis by taking aliquots, you know, and look at, at what's happening during the reaction at any point in time to a microfluidic experiment where we transfer this time axis to a distance axis. So we mix our, mix our components um, with the help of very specialized devices and then have basically from, for example, nucleation and growth, everything along a distance axis in a channel and can then scan at every point in time and you know, look at our experiment and, and the reactions in that. Why do we use microfluidics for that? It comes with a lot of key features and really the biggest advantages that are shown here. So when you go into microfluidics because of the size regime you're talking about, um, you have laminar flow and hence diffusion control. Um, that means that you, as I said before, you can actually you know, get from a time axis to a distance axis and get actually really into kinetic studies down to millisecond or even nanosecond um, time scales. Apart from that, you also get the advantage that you only need small sample volumes. So we're not talking even microliters, we're talking you know, nanoliters or even picoliters of samples that you need. And in very high um, dilution is even still possible to, to get information out of that. And especially when you talk about X-ray scattering, um, we have a continuously fresh sample. So because we do you know, not stop flow, but continuous flow experiments, um, you, you completely avoid beam damage at any point in time. So that leads to, you know, what I did during my PhD or what my, my whole group or both groups in which I was working were looking at. So we looked at, you know, metal or semiconductor or even polymer nanoparticles with X-ray scattering techniques. We could investigate nucleation growth or even processes of self-assembly. Um, and we even can go further and look at, you know, shear effects, alignment or arrangement of particles in flow. So just to get everyone on the same page, because, you know, we never know what sort of background people have when they come to these talks. I just quickly want to run through the fundamentals of the particles I'm used to, so you, you know what I'm talking about. So we start with gold nanorods. They are metal nanoparticles. And the thing about metal nanoparticles is um, they have something called a plasmon resonance, which is, you know, a confined effect when an electric field of incoming light interacts with the free electrons of the particle surface, and then they, have, they, they get a collective oscillation as um, something that looks like an electron cloud, and this can be seen as a plasma resonance. So if you have this in you know, spherical gold particles like here, then you get your plasma resonance as a more or less sharp peak, and this peak gives you direct information about the size of your particle, which is in this case the radius or diameter, whatever dimension you want to um, talk about. For gold nanorods, as they are anisotropic, um, these plasmon resonances are actually split into two effects. One of them is the transverse mode, and one of them is the longitudinal mode, which is you know, the parameters that define the anisotropy of your particle. And the interesting thing about this is the longitudinal mode actually shifts quite significantly with the size of your particle. So we will talk about this in a minute, um, just so you keep that in mind. So. If you want to look at any particles, the first step you have to do is come up with a good synthesis, obviously, because otherwise you can't see anything. So I used um, this synthesis. So it's, um, I just go through the single component. So you have CTAP as a stabilizer, which is the surfactant. Um, our precursor is gold acid, and um, we add nit um, silver nitride and hydroquinone as the reduction agent. Um, I point this out particularly because usually when you see um, gold nanorods, it's often done, like the synthesis is often done with ascorbic acid. And I particularly use hydroquinone because it's a very, very soft and very, you know, gentle reducing agent, which means um, the synthesis gets really slow and very controlled. So the gold nanorods that you get in the end are very, very monodispersed and, and really nicely defined in size and shape. Um, so almost all gold nanorod synthesis that leads to somehow monodispersed samples are seeded growth. So you add seeds in the growth solution and in the end, you know, at the right temperature and the right pH or some different ones, you get um, a mixture of gold nanorods. Um, so I optimize the synthesis so much that this is an actually unpurified sample image, like TM of a sample. So this is the amount and you know, the purity of, of nanorods that you can find in the end solution with a quite narrow distribution in length and width. And um, apart from that, also... Um, normal samples, or when I you know, did that first with a lot of gold nano synthesis, it looked something like this. And my, like my sample, my synthesis solution actually got quite concentrated, which is nice because that means you get a lot of scattering signal. Um, so I basically optimized it 
um, with the reduction agent to get you know defined size, slow reaction kinetics, and a high yield for a good good signal. So then, um, as I said, if you combine everything with X-ray scattering, um, we did or I did in situ small angle X-ray scattering and um, absorption measurements. So for that, um, we designed a 3D printed holder where we insert you know the beam comes in like this, and we have a 45 degree angle, also the fiber optics of a UV vis spectrometer. And the advantage of this setup is that you basically measure X-ray scattering, so shape and size information of your particles in the same sample volume where you get the optical information of absorption spectra. Um, and it looks like something seen here on the right. So you get in the top the absorption spectra where you can definitely see you know, both the transverse and the longitudinal plasma peak um, appearing over time, and then the longitudinal plasma peak shifting significantly to higher wavelengths as the particles grow. And then on the top, uh, on the bottom, you can see um, the X-ray scattering images as both a you know, 1D and a waterfall plot, where you can see that you know, the intensity is increasing, which speaks of a you know, higher volume of, like the particles have a bigger volume over time, increasing in volume. And this little um, oscillation is, is appearing and then shifting to lower Q, which um, speaks for growing particles. So if you look at these in situ growth kinetics and, you know, this is a time series, basically. So we start two minutes after the synthesis because I have to transfer it from a vial into my um, flowing capillary. And you know, look at the time scale of this. You can basically get the size of the particles and the shape of the particles at each point in time. So you get you know, something like the length and the width distribution, the aspect ratio from that. And as we measure from the same volume, also absorption spectra, we can get the longitudinal plasma peak over time. And if you looked in the, at these, you know, just dimensions in detail, we could found some, we found something really, really interesting. And this is this so-called double sigmoidal growth process. So usually if you have reaction kinetics, it always has this S shape. And for our particles, um, it had this like double S curve. And that's highly pointed towards, you know, a very new kinetic process because it wasn't actually seen in any other um, form so far. So the question is, where does that come from? Um, and for that, we had to look really closely at the shape information. And if you have any question for that, I'm happy to discuss this in detail afterwards, but it's a bit too much for this talk. However, you know, if you look at the, the curves, and as I said, I fitted every one of those separately, you start off with a sphere, obviously, because you have a you know, seeded growth synthesis where you put in spheres in the growth solution. And then you end up with a spherical cap cylinder, which you can get out of TM images really easy. But in that intermediate section, you know, at, at really low timescale still, um, both of the fitting models didn't really fit the curves that we had. And I had to go over to something like an ellipsoid, which rose the question, you know, with this double sigmoidal growth process that we saw in the length and width distribution, and then also, you know, now these shape models, is it an actual shape transformation through an ellipsoidal form, or is it an actual, you know, an optical illusion and says, you know, the actual mixture has shapes that are really different and just look together like an ellipsoid? So to you know, make our point a bit stronger about what we actually see with this ellipsoidal shape, we measured some high-res TEM images. I got some high-res TEM images of the solution during the synthesis. And what we saw is we start from a sphere, we end up with this you know, spherical cap cylinder. And in between, we have this ellipsoidal-like shape, which you know, comes from different facets growing at different speeds. And these facets, before they do this popcorn mechanism and you know, pop out to this anisotropic rod shape, they actually, it's quite interesting that the kinetics is highly influencing the curves of, you know, length and width grow over time that we saw before. So we actually came up with, a, you know, a, a model and a mechanism how this growth appears, which hasn't been, you know, seen before in that detail. So with all this data, um, we actually got an, a, a gimmick that I didn't expect to find. So, you know, the, the process was like that. I was a PhD student. I fitted all these curves. And my supervisor is always telling me that, you know, the low Qs always fitted really nicely. And then at this oscillation, you know, bigger than 0 0.1 in Q, um, inverse angstrom, it didn't quite fit. And it, we played around with a lot of, you know, models how to fit this best, or, you know, different shapes and different sizes, and it just never fitted. And then at some point he was like, ah, oh, you know, how about we just try a core shell model because, you know, we can't lose anything. So we did try a core shell model. 
And um, suddenly we got all these curves so nicely fit that you know, we were thinking about what the shell could be. And then if you fit a core shell model, you actually get a quite a bit of information about density and you know, parameters of the shell compared to the rod. And um, looking into the details a bit closer, so the model was a homogeneous core and inhomogeneous shell, so not the same material. Um, looking into the details a bit closer, um, this shell turned out to be um, the exact parameters for CTAP. And the shell thickness, if you, you know, average over like all the measurement curves that I did of one synthesis, came about 3.14 nanometers, which is really, really close to Sun's experiments that you know, were done by other groups before, which showed that the CTAP shell around nanorods is about 32 angstrom. So you know, that is close enough for us to believe that we could actually make the CTAP shell visible with X-ray scattering, which shouldn't be because you know, it doesn't scatter much, with a core shell model around these um, curves. So in summary, um, you know, we could slow down a reaction with hydroquinone as a reducing agent um, slow enough to look at you know, slow to medium reaction kinetics and do in situ measurement of the optical properties simultaneously to the structural information and evolution. Um, we saw this double sigmoidal growth mechanism and came up with you know, a, a mechanism to explain how this actually works with passive growth. Um, and did this also in a high variation of precursor concentration. So as I said, I have a lot of data to show for that. It's too much for this talk, but I'm happy to discuss this in detail. Um, the growth kinetics model seems to be from a sphere to over like an ellipsoid intermittent phase to a spherical cap cylinder, which is you know, confirmed by TM images. Um, and we can even detect the CTAP shell thickness by fitting these um, fitting curves with a core shell model. So to give you a bit of an outlook, you know, the thing is, if you if you do a PhD in this kind of scenario, you come up with you know really really high, highly monodispersed or really uniform synthesis solutions, and you only look at the growth of these particles, and then you have these solutions standing around and don't really know what to do with them. So it's a bit of a waste, and um, to not let these beautiful particles go to waste, um, my colleagues actually showed quite a lot of interest in to look at the behavior. If you use these final particles in a purified version even, um, to avoid you know, bubbling from CTAP as a surfactant, and then look at the alignment of them in spray. So they use microfluidic, or we together use microfluidic devices, not for just channels where we you know, look at the growth over time, but we actually use them as a nozzle device where we spray it out. And um, you can look at them and see how these nanoparticles align at different stages you know, across the stream and along the stream, and then even across and along droplet formation, and compare these to um, cylindrical micelles and sheet-like particles, which is you know, like platelets, yeah, which was really, really quite a nice effect and, and really nice um, paper coming out of there. So moving on, um, this was still quite a bit of, you know, a way around the actual microfluidic device because all we did was you know, doing a synthesis and then letting it flow through capillary. But we wanted to invent devices where we can actually really mix and, and get into detail with diffusion control of, of particles. And um, one of the systems that I got really early on, so my, my master's and my PhD was about this system, was about um, 135 benzene tricarboxamides. Um, that's an awfully long name. So we just use BTA as a um, acronym for that. Um, being at Amsterdam now, I learned that acronyms is our wealth, so BTA it is. And this molecule looks like this, and it's actually quite nice because it was um, synthesized by a group at our same university, which is macromolecular chemistry, um, who looked at, you know, how these, they, they were like really interested in fiber formation and using these things for filters and stuff. And they came up with this molecule, which looks like this. So it's a, you know, tri-negative charged um, acid, basically. All right, am I? And um, the, the fun fact about this is if you add hydrochloric acid, you protonize all of these carboxyl groups on the end, and this whole molecule gets uncharged. So if you see here, like, it's really bad to imagine that, but just, you know, go along with me. This molecule basically looks like a disc. So as it is drawn, it's pretty flat, and it basically looks like a disc. So if this molecule is charged, these discs get highly repulsive. You know, they don't want to be around each other, obviously. But now that you have an uncharged form of this molecule, um, these discs can nicely assemble themselves and build so-called nanofibrils or fibers. Um, and the nicest thing about this is if they build these fibers, 
they get fluorescent. So if you see here with decreasing pH, um, the fluorescent intensity is increasing. Um, so what we did with that is basically come up with a design that kind of introduces both reactants, so the charged molecule um, and the HCl in a, in a way that we get diffusion control and get a really, really nice onset point of this you know, uncharged mechanism, so the protein, protonation mechanism, when it builds these fibrils and starts to fluoresce. So the device that we use for that is pretty fancy and it's like way into you know, microfluidics, but I'm trying and attempt to break this down in like really short. So we use a multi-layer device, which is um, three-dimensional, um, only for the reason to do three-dimensional hydrodynamic focusing. So what you have to imagine is, you know, in this middle area here, um, the main channel, your BTA stream comes in, it's all charged, and we can't just let HDL come in, you know, to that and react with that because otherwise it would probably clock the channel and, you know, at some point get stuck and then block the channel completely and this whole thing would probably leak and at some point even explode if the pressure gets too high. So what we did was we introduced um, a so-called buffer layer. So an inert solution, in our case, water, because all of the solutions are aqueous. Um, and, you know, let this focus nicely in, like, the middle of the stream and then introduce a second reactant. So you get this kind of focusing where you have an inert layer around your middle stream and then, you know, your H plus ions can like, diffuse through your innate, inert water layer um, and react with your BTA in the middle. And if you do that, um, you can see that the fluorescence is increasing along the outlet channel. So, you know, you let this flow along the outlet channel, you look into like um, a fluorescent microscope, um, and you can see that the intensity is increasing along the outlet channel. And, you know, as you would expect, if you go higher with the flow rates, obviously you shift the onset point of this fluorescence further down the channel because everything gets just faster. Um, the problem is with these things, these channels to make it easy for us were built out of PDMS, so polydimethyl siloxane, so silicon. And um, to everyone who ever did you know, X-ray scattering on silicon, it's really not nice. So we had to come up with something to not have to scatter, you know, like shoot our X-rays through the silicon chip device. So how we did this was um, we took our PDMS channels and cut them off just after the mixing cross. So, you know, by this time, we still have this nicely in the center of the stream focused um, BTA and whatever, and our solutions. And then we cut it off and insert a glass capillary, which is, you know, completely, well, almost completely inert to x-rays. And so we get a nice background and really nice intensity of our, of our sample in that. So these hybrid devices still have the same focusing and, you know, the, because we have laminar flow, it won't get any distortion or something, but can now have a really low background for our measurements. And to prove that we are not, not somehow messing up our flow, I took um, confocal microscopy images. So I'll just show you the 2D ones here. Um, where you can see, you know, the central flow gets um, focused here and then it comes the second one in. So you can even see the double focusing here. And um, as you move from, you know, the device into the glass capillary, which is you know, inserted here, you can see that the flow is undisturbed and still focused as we wanted it. So now we're set up to do in-situ sucks. So this is our fancy holder. The X-ray stream comes, you know, from, from the ring to the detector. 45-degree um, angle to that um, is the UV vis. It's here just now, unfortunately, shown with a really, really bright light on it. But now you can even see the capillary which goes to the holder here. So it's just, you know, held in place by this copper tube, which can even be heated if you wanted it to, but for us, it's just the holder because it's in room temperature. Um, the microfluidic chip here attached on the end. And then you can see here the tubing coming in from your solutions. So if you do that, you can do position resolved X-ray scattering along the outlet you know, channel at different flow rates. And you can see that you get some, some scattering intensity from whatever is forming there. And it's different for different flow rates, which is what we hope to see. And um, if you look into these, you know, modeling and fitting these curves, then you can get something. So we want to we, we build fibers, so it should be something really long and with a certain radius. And if you do the um, evaluation of it, you can see that the length of these you know, fibers is actually increasing um, when you move along the channel position, but the radius is not, which is nice. So they're basically stacking one or you know, a few assemblage of molecules at a time. So the radius stays the same and the length is forming, which is really nice because it gives you a very, very defined um, length grows along the channel. 
So yeah, looking into this diffusion a little bit more in detail, um, what I said before is we rely on you know diffusion of H plus to your central stream. So we have something called an interdiffusion layer where you know your reactants eventually mix. And our in our case, this is here shown by you know an increase in, in appearance of fluorescence. Um, the thing is though, if you see that, you can kind of see like the two outer streams of fluorescence, and in the middle, it doesn't seem like there's lots of things happening. And if you go, you know, with like cross sections through the channel, you can see that the fluorescence looks like these two peak, um, overlapping peaks kind of uh, profiles. So um, if you look at these, you know, the maximas are obviously where the H plus hits the BTA negatively charged on the outside of the stream. And um, what we did with that was trying to model this to see, you know, if we can come up with a mechanism and can prove the diffusion relation of this, um, this whole system. And um, the important thing, so I have some scary math equation here for everyone who's not fond of that. Um, it's not really hard, and I will talk you through this quickly. Um, the important thing is, you know, we have two concentrations that are important. One is of the BTA negatively charged, and the other one is of the H+. And the C3 here, you know, is the charged, uh, uncharged BTA, which then forms the nanofibrils. And the important thing is that this reaction is only dependent on the reaction coefficient K. So if you look into you know, how you define these two concentrations of the charged you know, BTA and the H+, you have these two equations. And what is standing out here is that both of them are in dependency of the diffusion of H+. So you can basically you know, get this whole thing simulated by equations which are only dependent on the diffusion of your protons to your stream, which is exactly what we wanted. And that fits so nicely. So. Um, in summary to this, we could, you know, we found out that we need a three-dimensional double focusing device for a highly controlled focusing of the reaction stream, leading to a central localized reaction without any wall contact. I come to that in a second, why this is important. Um, we can follow the formation of these fibrils with blue fluorescence um, along the channel by fluorescence microscopy, confocal microscopy, and whatnot. Um, you can monitor this fiber assembly with sucks and, you know, had to go over to these PDMS glass hybrid devices for that and compare this plug flow BTA assembly um, with viscosity change and everything um, to like a parabolic flow profile and can actually model this. As an outlook, and that's really quick um, to not overwhelm you with this, we did this sort of system also with polymers. So we can also look at the assembly of polymers. And in this case, um, it is a polymer that assembles and um, so it's a fluorescent polymer. And if you change um, the solvent, so not GPH, but just the solvent from, for example, DMSO to DMF or water, um, it quenches the fluorescence. So um, what's really nice is you can follow these, you know, fluorescent molecules, either in appearing or disappearing fluorescence along the channel and can see the assembly actually by eye, well, in this case, by um, fluorescent microscopes or confocal microscopes um, along the channel. And you can model this or simulate this here, in this case, in the COMSOL, and can see, you know, how the stream diffuses and, and how, you know, solvent is exchanging and can get a lot of reaction kinetics out down to like million nanoseconds, which is really impressive. So going further, you know, we went from slow synthesis to something which is in the medium time scale. And then we really wanted to challenge the system. And to challenge the system, we went on to something which is really, really fast kinetics. In this case, semiconductor nanoparticles. So semiconductor nanoparticles are also called quantum dots. And they're a really hot topic because of something which is called an exciton. So what happens in those materials, semiconductors? Um, you can, if you have a photon you know, of an incident light with the equal energy, where the, the energy is equal to the band gap of the material, you can excite an electron from the valence band to the conducting band. And um, this electron that's now you know, in the upper band, in the conduction band, leaves behind a hole. So this hole is, you know, it's basically positively charged. Um, and this exciton hole pair is called so-called exciton. So you know, they can recombine because they're really short-lived. And if they recombine, they emit light, which has the same energy than the light that came in in the first place. And this light is, you know, can be seen as a sharp fluorescent peak. And this the interesting thing about this, or the very, very, really important thing about this is that this fluorescence peak shifts um, red shifts with increasing size. So you can see here, you know, bigger particles have this fluorescent peak at higher wavelengths, smaller particles at lower wavelengths. So 
in my system or for, for my experiment, and this is really just the start of this whole, you know, rabbit hole of quantum dot synthesis in microfluidics. I wanted to have some synthesis which is fairly easy to adapt in the channel to see if it works at all. So I used some synthesis that you know doesn't require a lot of precursors and it didn't require high temperatures or pressures. So in my case, cadmium sulfide nanoparticles made from cadmium chloride and sodium sulfide at room temperature, you know, forming these nicely fluorescent cadmium sulfide particles, which are usually like green or yellow. So I give this disclaimer every time because I got a lot of, you know, criticism about this. These are my nanoparticles. They are small and they're not highly, highly monodispersed because this is, you know, microfluidic synthesis. And I, I say this because people expect to have the same synthesis, you know, control that you get in batch where you, you know, spend decades and decades to optimizing synthesis. Um, this is not highly optimized and this is really, you know, the best I could get in like a year of work, which is not focusing on the synthesis conditions at all. So I got particles, they are somewhat uniform and they show me, you know, a somewhat uniform absorption and, and fluorescence. So that's what I wanted and that's what I got. Um, one of them is stabilized with thioglycerol and the other one with L-cysteine just to show that, you know, it's not limited to one system only. And coming back to the microfluidic device, so my, my attempt was to have one device that fits it all, you know, one shoe that fits it all. So I, I got this device, which I also showed you before already, and I wanted really to, to have a device that I can use for all types of synthesis that does the same thing and prevents this. And that comes, um, you know, if you use the wrong device, it comes always with a cost. So this is not this device, this is a different one, which didn't work. And um, I show you the negatives because that just makes the point why these are important. If you don't have a device which is working and gives you this nice you know, three-dimensional focusing in the middle of the stream without wall contact, you get nanoparticles that grow on the wall, mainly because there's a non-slip condition in microfluidics. Also because you know, if you have wall contact and you have nanoparticles growing, especially with um, you know, highly reactant and fast growing solutions, you get um, heterogeneous and homogeneous nucleation. So you know, these actually are the cause um, for other nucleation mechanisms. So you get a lot of particles blocking the channel. And this is unfortunate because once you have a layer of particles there, they will not go away. And you can't measure with anything through the channel because all you will see is in fluorescence, a wall of fluorescence from these particles and with x-rays, and you know, a lot of signal from this, whatever schlons there is. Um, so this is really not nice. So we needed a, a device that really gets our reaction away from the channel walls, hence this three-dimensional focusing. So if you get it right, and I fortunately did, um, you have the same setup as before. You have one reactant in the main channel, and then you know, in the first side channel comes a buffer solution, in our case, again, water. And in the second comes the second reaction. So you have cadmium ions here, you know, the sodium source, um, sorry, <laughs> the sulfur source in the second channel. Um, and along the channel, you know, at different time scales, you should see the cadmium sulfide nanocrystals nucleation and growth. Um, and you can actually follow this with confocal microscopy and see, you know, there's the mixing cross. I indicated this with the arrows. This one's actually so long that you can only see the second cross. Um, and you can see this fluorescent stream appearing indicated by this gray arrow here and incre increasing in fluorescence intensity, you know, along the channel, which is nice. So basically what that tells you is at different time scales, you know, like T1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the same that I showed you above here. You can look at the channel and see, you know, oh, this is just the start of the nucleation and back here is like full-on growth of nanoparticles with a certain size. And if you look into that in detail and, you know, measure absorption and emission at the same time, um, which, you know, is the same setup basically as before, um, you can look into, you know, how the absorption increases and shifts and also how the fluorescence intensity is, you know, increasing and can see the reaction kinetics as, you know, a function of, um, the precursor ratio, actually. So for these synthesis, it's really important to know that the cadmium to sulfur ratio in your synthesis is highly important and you know, makes a big difference on the outcome of your particle. So your size is not dependent on the reaction time. They will grow anyway to a certain threshold, but on the ratio of cadmium to sulfur. And um, we could see that, you know, the reaction kinetics are different depending on this and, you know, can see that the glass and PDMS doesn't really make a difference, which is nice. Um, we confirmed this with X, XRD studies, so we could see, you know, the, the XRD letters of um, cadmium 
sulfide nanoparticles, which you know, prove our whole point. So in summary, um, we could you know, follow the direct investigation and do the direct investigation of really, really fast reaction kinetics. And we follow nucleation and growth even, not just the growth of particles inside a microfluidic device um, and can investigate you know, the influence of precursor variation, which I showed you in the end. The big but is, and you know, everyone who listens still <laughs> after a half an hour talk, is that I didn't do X-ray scattering with this. Why did I not do this? Um, it has two reasons. And the main reason is actually that um, we basically need microfocus um, X-ray beams for that. So we need an X-ray beam which is small enough to have a low signal-to-noise ratio and the spectral resolution in the channel. So the nanoparticle synthesis is so fast and it's really, really messy with all the you know, stabilizer that you have in the solution that I tried this in X-ray scattering with the beam available um, at the synchrotron here. And I'm waiting desperately to get the microfocus beam here to try this again, because this would be the next step and the final step in this project, which would give us you know, real access to the size and shape of the particles from literally time you know, zero. So with that, um, I want to thank you for your attention and quickly acknowledge a lot of people that did a great job you know, supporting me with this work. Obviously, my two supervisors from my PhD, Paul and Stefan, as well as the groups that I worked in, and um, obviously the team at the Australian Synchrotron and the DAISY. So as I said, I worked at the Saxbox Beamline and the Petra P3 Beamline before for this. Um, and then a lot of funding because you know, joint PhD is nothing without the money to fly from one end to the, of the world to the other. So yeah, there's a lot of um, funding from the DAB and uh, yeah, Federal Ministry of Education Research. Um, and yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>